Welcome to The Failure Factor, folks. This is a show where we hear stories from successful entrepreneurs about challenges and failures. You'll learn from their mistakes and see how they used failure to their advantage. Now, I'm your host, Megan Bruneau. I'm a therapist, executive coach, writer, and speaker. And I got into this because I myself used to be just so petrified of failure and so entrenched in perfectionism that... I thought I was living the life that I wanted to, um, but I really wasn't. And I was experiencing a lot of pain and um, anxiety and depression and eating disorders and stuff as a result. And I actually wasn't able to achieve the success that I wanted to. And, you know, this episode is is going to be very different. So you may have already seen in uh, the show notes or in the title, um, this is not so much about an entrepreneur's failure. This is about the failure of America um, to particularly women right now, which of course is my very biased opinion. And I, I'm not going to try to pretend that I don't have biases around everything that's been happening in current events lately, um, particularly because I've seen the impact it's had on my clients. And so I felt really motivated just to have a conversation that I hope can empower and enlighten some listeners uh, to either join the conversation if you haven't already or feel more grounded in an understanding as to why this conversation is so important. Or even, you know, if you disagree with, um, you know, what I just said or what I have just said, maybe it'll it'll just give you this a different perspective on um, the side that suggests that, uh, you know, that America has kind of failed women recently and and you know at least in the last couple of years and and always you know in many ways and why we still have a lot of work to do and why we're not just like overreacting um by stating that there's inequality so this episode is actually a conversation with uh one of my best friends um sari rosenberg she is a uh, a history teacher she is a tv personality she's a writer um she is the founder of a a feminist club at her school um and she's just like an incredible human very very wise and um you know a real expert in in her stuff so um i wanted to have a conversation with her because i think it's a beautiful way of understanding a bit more about like what feminism actually is some of the misconceptions in there and why, you know, I think after listening to this conversation, it would be very strange if you didn't identify as a feminist. Um, And what the history of feminism is and like the the waves that have led to where we are now and and where we are now and where we need to go from here and how to not be a white feminist, um, you know, or just uh, be a person who's concerned with um, equality uh, with regards to uh, gender as opposed to other intersections of oppression, um, how to bring other people into the conversations in a way that, you know, you increase your chances of of feeling heard and vice versa. And then also like how we all suffer living in this patriarchal system, you know, all genders suffer and how it relates to dating and body image and eating disorders and reproductive freedom and sexual assault. And Sarah and I share our own experiences, um, with, uh, some of those challenges. So yeah, I mean, I just like, it's a long episode it's a different episode. If you're listening for a uh, business strategy, you're probably not going to find much, um, but you know, who knows? Uh, and, uh, I think that it will give you some insight one way or another. And I encourage you to listen over like a couple of sessions or, um, you know, go for like a really long walk or like clean your apartment or, you know, maybe listen on a long commute or something like that. But either way, um, you know, thank you in advance for listening to this conversation. I think it will give you some of the tools that you need to, uh, join the greater conversation and feel empowered to, um, stand up for what I think we all should believe in. But again, those are my biases. So, uh, enjoy. Okay, Sari, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so happy we to be here. We are finally fucking doing this. This has been like years in the making. It really has been Has years. it been years? It's been years, I think. Uh, about a year and a half, I think. The, it the feels, making. yeah. Yeah, so Sari and I met on a train uh, on the way to Montauk. Yeah. Um, and we, it was like a blind date, really, it to was. be co writing Train Buddies. And we just like hit it off. Yeah, we both probably wanted to take that tr- solo ride to yeah. Montauk. Yeah, we did. <laughs> but then the minute we met, we just couldn't yeah. stop talking. In my head, I even, I think I even said to someone, I was like, I'm supposed to meet up with a, this, a friend of a friend, but I mean, I'm hoping that she feels the same way and she's just going to want to like read her book too. <laughs> and then we just talked for three and a half, yeah. three and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, essentially. Like, and then I broke my phone that weekend. You I broke my me. phone. Yeah. Yeah. You broke your phone. <laughs> 
again. <laughs> yes. You ran on it anyway, which will play into some of the oh, things we're going to talk about, about women and body image and shit. So yeah, we have a lot to talk about. It was so, a big weekend. Um, okay, cool. So a year and a half later, we're finally doing this because like current events have inspired enough rage yes. in me recently that I'm like, we need to... Like, we just need to talk right. about we were, all of these things. We were going to have this conversation anyway, so we decided, let's just start recording them finally. Yeah, the truth is, I called Sarah yesterday, and I was like, I just need to talk. Like, I just feel like I need I need an outlet right now. And um, she's like, yeah, we should get together and go for a walk. And I was like, you know what? We should record it. Yes. So that's <laughs> because, why we're sitting here instead. Because, yes, exactly. Because this conversation is so important, hopefully. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> that, that our, yeah. We, we realize that preemptively what we're about to talk about is so important that Every, other people are going to want to listen. listen. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> we will look, Sari, tell everyone about yourself. Okay. So, my name's Sari Rosenberg. I am, I've been teaching U.S. history and a public high school here in New York City. This is my 16th year. I'm also a writer. I'm a feminist, feminism expert and a feminist, of course. And well, of course, because if I'm a feminism expert, <laughs> let's hope I'm a feminist, yeah. right? <laughs> so do you would, you would I don't even know anymore, man. I don't know. I don't know. Woman. I, don't I, don't, even know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything anymore. There's, okay. Some people, it's like, you know, they surprise you. Yeah. But yeah, by the way, I'm Most, a feminist. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. And a feminism expert. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm really angry. I think, oh, I think a lot of people are angry. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I'm angry and like so discouraged and heartbroken, but also, you know what I have to say, and I said this to you early on the phone, but I'm going to say it again because yeah. I think it's a great metaphor. There was a period a few years ago where we were like looking at the ocean and we're like, the ocean's so beautiful. Let's look at the sunset over the ocean. Let's swim in the ocean. And then like recently we're like, holy shit, there's all this plastic in the ocean. We're ruining the ocean. We should ban straws, you know? Right. And so I think that that's a bit of what's happening right now. Like we're seeing the fucking plastic and garbage in the ocean right now. And we're like, oh, it's been there all along. We didn't realize how bad it was. Now we realize how bad it is. Now maybe we can do something about it. Right. I hope. And actually, I'm glad you used that metaphor, share that metaphor with me this morning because I, yesterday I was, last night I, well, yesterday I protested and I was feeling really angry, but then I saw A, St- a Star is Born, which I highly recommend. Oh. Plug for a movie. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's not uplifting but it also is I mean it's more uplifting than watching like the news and stuff reality and so I was feeling okay I was kind of escaping from everything and I woke up really angry and then you gave me that analogy that is it a metaphor analogy both let's say it's both yeah sure I'm not an English (laughs) teacher (laughs) I don't need to know these things and it it, for some reason it just having that image in my head made it feel better like I like I'm angry but then I also feel like women are women and men are bonding more and about these things and having conversations that would not be had before. Totally. 100%. All. I think this yeah. is like, this all has to happen. And this is like, look, this conversation wouldn't happen if it weren't for that. That's right. True. So, you know, this is just a little, one more plug for emotional intelligence. There's nothing wrong with anger. It's how we react to anger that can be unhealthy, helpful, Absolutely. you know, responding to anger in a constructive way, which is, you know, doing something like this, I think, yeah. um, or at least creating the illusion for ourselves that we're doing something constructive right. with it empowers us and right. hopefully we'll advocate for some change. So yeah. For me, I've always been really aware of how, like, the the personal is political, I guess you could say, Mm -hmm. but um, when I look back now, I just realize how many of my personal experiences with, like, eating disorders and sexual assault and shame and depression and burnout and perfectionism and even, like, being a single woman you know, 32 dating in New York and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe, I mean, there are challenges to dating in New York for sure, but I think it's a place where it's right. certainly more celebrated to be single and stuff yeah. like that. But you know, if I were 32 anywhere else and single and childless, you know, it's, I'm outcasted yeah, in many right. ways. You'd be the only person. Yeah. So, so I think just like really understanding how, um, you know, some of these systems have continued to prevent us from feeling good. Yeah. And also just like these various different aspects of, of oppression that contribute to people's experience and really Mm -hmm. how I see it in my clients, like how their experience is affected by all of that. Um, so, and, and, you know, just other things that I think are current, like, I think we should, we should chat about things like white feminism, for example, um, which is sort of the opposite of intersectionality and some of the criticisms. And then for you and I, who are two white women sitting here, like how do we be allies and not co-opt and not like, you know, do the opposite of pass the mic, I guess, hoard the mic, right. You know, when we should be passing it and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. And and just only be selectively an ally. Yeah, totally. Right. Exactly. So, um, and and, you know, and also something else that you and I've talked about that we should talk about on here as well is like 
how internalized misogyny or actually what what my lawyer to advise me to oh, refer yes. to as male supremacy right um and, is, and it's white supremacy over racism and it, male supremacy over exactly misogyny. exactly yeah. um you know we all play into and how um you know women contribute to the problem mm-hmm. simply because like we've been raised to believe that men are are superior to women right, right? so it's superior to other genders right. i i've been teaching at the same school for 16 years i've been living in new york city since 1994 amazing so i'll tell you my age then since the, yeah <laughs> i've been i'm 43 years old i am i have a partner i have a boyfriend but i am under the law i'm a single woman uh, I do not have any children. I mean, but I, you know, I teach 34 kids every 45 minutes oh, times five. 34 kids in your yeah, class? Yeah, there's 34 kids in a class. How old are they? They're 15 and 16 year olds. Cool. So I teach kids that from all over New York City. Where My high school is a public school, Title I, which means that uh, 80% of the student body qualifies or for a partial or free lunch. So definitely an underserved population. And... I come from an upper middle class white suburban background. So it's like a lot of, the, I feel like, and it sounds like a cliche, but I probably learned more about the world and it does sound like so corny, but it's true. I've definitely learned more about the world teaching in this high school than I did. I mean, I learned obviously lots of academic stuff in college and high school and grad school, but I think that it's truly made me a better person just working with people that I probably would sit on the subway with on a bus and never have real conversations. And it's, it's been every year is a different learning experience. And I feel like if anyone can even just like work with teenagers, maybe even once a month or once a year, it's, it really helps you. Just, it, they, they're much, I think we're learning this from all the, the Parkland activists, but teenagers are a lot smarter and emotionally intelligent and aware of the world than I think a lot of adults realize, or I think they're starting to realize it now. Yeah. But I've, I've learned that from the minute I started teaching. I mean, when I first started teaching, I was 27 and they were only 10 years younger. Now, right. I'm, now I'm like older than their parents, yeah. which is weird. Well, yeah. they're so resourced, right? Like mm-hmm. nowadays, I mean, because we didn't have like the internet. No. Or did we? I mean, I, was, I didn't. You definitely didn't. I'm old, so I didn't. I don't, Think, did you in high school? I mean, I guess we, I guess I did, yeah. But it wasn't like the internet like God, it is today. I, I mean, did have we didn't have like I didn't have a cell. You didn't phone have like a or, smartphone. Oh God, no, no, I didn't have a smartphone until my. They, until every school. student, even you know, regardless of their parents' income, they all have smartphones for the yeah. most part. I don't know if that's true for every public school situation. So they, you know, they Google stuff. Like yeah. I've had kids, especially in my classes, like my AP, AP classes, which are advanced placement right. classes. They're definitely fact checking me, yeah. so you gotta be on your game more. It no just, shit. Te- the technology definitely changed. Do, do you experience. think that that's like empowering for them? Like, if, like I'm just thinking, yeah. you know, if they are Title One, like I would imagine there's a lot of oppression, right? Like, Absolutely. what's like the race distribution or the, the cost I think, distribution? I, be- I mean, I think I could. I mean, I would say seventy percent Hispanic. Yeah. So. Like I have to have to look at the facts. Like thirty percent. Right. I'm like that's not right though. But like basically, there's. I'm often. Let's put it this way. I'm often the only white person in the room. Right. Right. What's that like for you? It's, I'm used to it now. When I first started teaching, it was, it was, it was a a big adjustment. Not because I don't have, you know, it's like, it's not like, oh, I don't have friends who are not white. But for the most part, I mean, I think New York City is still very segregated. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually we're the majority in our social groups. Yeah. Um, And I feel like, well, it was the first year I started teaching, they had a hard time understanding me because I didn't act like a typical white lady to them. So, to like, I, I think I would wear like heels and I had a blazer. I still do that, but I was like wearing heels and a blazer. And, and I remember they'd be, like, but I also knew who like the rappers were that they liked. They just did not understand. Right. So they would be like, You're like Carrie on Sex in the City. And I'm like, No. Like, they were trying to figure out what I was based right. on the white women they know on TV. Yeah. And then when I started being like, I know Cameron or whatever rappers they were into. Yeah. It got really confusing for them. So I felt like that was, I, I mean, obviously it's like I don't know, talking about race and racism is complex, but totally. I feel like it, especially now, especially after Trump was elected, I try to go out of my way to be an ally to him, not just performatively, but you know, like, letting them also know that it's not all the white ladies on the bus who maybe are 
move their seat over because they have certain stereotypes, they're not all like that. They can maybe think of me too. Totally. And not to say that I have that much power, but if I'm in a class with the kids, I want them to know that not all white, because they can definitely start having those opinions based on the experiences they share with me with white people in New York City. Totally. And I think that that's like, it's such a, a nuanced conversation, that conversation around like being an ally right. or being a performative ally, which, you know, I'm just assuming from... Um, the terminology yeah. that, you know, somebody who's not necessarily actually an ally, but they're doing it for the optics right. or and, for their personal And yeah, like, and I was reading about it recently because, I mean, I learned that, I knew that concept, but I didn't know the phrase until one of my students came to this feminist club that I have at my school, which I can talk more about, and I didn't explain that in my intro, but oh, okay. I also have a feminist club <laughs> at my school, and, and a student who was coming back, returning from she's in college she was in college now she is in college now she used that term and I never heard of it before I mean now I understand what it means yeah. but basically it's the idea and I think people do this to different degrees without realizing it that when you're around people who are brown and black and you know not white not part they you and you are an open-minded woke person as people say you you know you're an ally but what happens when you're not there? Like, what are you actually doing? So, like, if you're sitting at a table with white people who have racist ideas without even realizing it, are you quiet? Right. Because then you're not really an ally, right? Yeah. Someone makes some kind of joke like those people. Do you just kind of ignore it and pretend you didn't hear it? And I've definitely been in situations where I'm like, at first I would just kind of let it go. And then I was like, you know what, I can't be, I can't let people, like, you know, people be like, what's it like in your school? Is it like a real inner city school right. with that kind of tone? And yeah. I, and I definitely had, it definitely leads to very difficult, intense conversations that people weren't asking for right. because they immediately assume that because I'm a white woman from yeah. an upper middle class background that I'm going to be like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing there. It's right. crazy. But I start defending the students and the population and, you know, calling them out on that kind of language that they don't even realize they're doing and right. it definitely doesn't always it's not the kind of conversation they actually wanted to have yeah absolutely yeah I, I can relate to that I mean again I feel like that's like every fucking date I go on right um, like, like I, I actually just laughed her last night I'm like I don't think I can date anymore I, I just do have, you feel like it's yeah. I know you're asking me questions but do you no, feel no, like you ask me questions yeah this do you a feel like we, <laughs> how does one talk <laughs> We both just because there's a microphone here, I'm like, can I ask you a question? This is how we actually talk. <laughs> Megan, yes. can I just jump in and ask you a question? Right yes. for a second. You have permission. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. So do you I know that a lot of my friends who are dating and like I hate also asking this question because I've been up until four and a half years ago I yeah. was single for like a de more than a decade yeah. and so oh I God, that's like the decade I'm going into yeah right you're, you're yeah. in that or decade yeah, in that yeah. Decade. like yeah. and so that was my more than a decade I'm yeah like, and I feel like I hate it when people be like what's dating like or like or like <laughs> I have a single friend that you might like because yeah. they're single like you yeah and I hate cost coming from that place yeah. but I'm still doing it but I do feel like even before the 2016 election I would get in weird political fights on dates, yeah. like especially after one, give me one drink, and then I'm like, let's really talk about yeah. Sarah Palin or whatever, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to talk, whatever I was really angry about politically. But it wasn't as, things weren't as polarized, yeah. so I could still be like, I can understand why you're conservative, but now I feel like if I were to, so many of my friends go on dates, and you know, the minute they realize that the person is actually a closeted Trump supporter yeah. they are they just have to leave the yeah. date and do you find that it do you think it, that people are it, more fired so up so it's, it's like hard that? because i so i think given um you know i have family members who are um like very different from me yes. politically yes i have learned that it is not helpful to just like get in a screaming match slash um remove yourself from the conversation mm -hmm. and sometimes that's what you need to do for mm -hmm. self-care you know mm -hmm. in fact this past week particularly like I've had a lot of places where I'm like, I don't know if I can fight this fight right now. I think I yeah. need to just like be really gentle with myself. And that's because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's a, it's an extreme as it is for many women, like the topic of sexual assault. It's like a really, right. that's a, you know, I can, I can, I can remain pretty equanimous when it comes to like, but you know, weight or body image right. or, you know, or other aspects of like women's rights and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But you know, one that's I'm so deeply personally affected by, mm -hmm. like I, um, have a hard time not yeah. getting emotional about, but so, so I have not, I've yet to have an experience where I just like 
up and leave. Um, because I don't think that that's a way that I think that's a, it just gives people confirmation that women are right. hysterical, hysterical, right? And right. you know, I agree. Um, you can write us off because mm. we're just so emotional, and we can't even argue with you. Exactly, and that's why we're leaving. exactly, right. exactly. And I actually read a, a good book recently um, that is controversial. I, I'd mm. be curious on what your opinion was on it, but it's called The Coddling of the American Mind, Ooh. and um, it's you know the the dudes two you know two white dudes who wrote it. I'm pretty sure they're two white dudes yeah. from the way that they write. Um, um, and you know, they're kind of saying like all this stuff around like white fragility and mm. like calling people out. It's not helpful for the conversation. Mm. And you know, there's some things that they're saying where I'm like, Oh, like they don't understand internalized biases or, right. you know, our unconscious biases and stuff like that. Um, you know, kind of saying, well, was everything a microaggression or, or some right. things just like, you know, a person just innocently made a mistake. And right. like, I do think that there are some places in there where they make valid points. There are some where I'm like, I would definitely disagree mm. with that. But I do think that sometimes just like shutting down the conversation, unless it's like an act of self care, I don't know if it's really helpful for our argument. Yeah. So the way I like to do it, and I mean, I do this in every aspect of my life. I'm always trying to infiltrate, right? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well maybe there's a way that, yeah, this dude swiped right on me because he thinks I'm hot or like this person right. is following me on Instagram because he likes like blonde white women right. and this, you know, he'll be like liking my posts until I write something political and then he fucking tears me has down something to say. and has something to say because I've used right. my voice and yeah. I'm more than just an ornament just to a him. pretty picture. Exactly. And so, you know, those are places where I feel like either if I have some level of trust with the human that's sitting across the table from me or some level of respect that I've developed, they're now seeing me as like an actual person and I can right. try to give them a, a different experience. And, you know, it's, it's shitty because I do wonder, you know, if the color of my skin were different, mm -hmm. would I still, you know, have enough, um, have as much like clout, you know, would they still right. be listening to me would, or would they just dismiss me? Because again, that would be a place where their biases would come right. in and they like would see Like you're just angry it. and you're, not, right, you're exactly. playing identity politics. Yeah. yeah. And... So, so I mean, dating wise, I guess like long story short, it's, I think for me right now, I'm really struggling with, um, and maybe this is just like rationalizing, you know, my experiences of rejection, but mm. I think I'm really struggling with, uh, the belief that perhaps because I don't conform to what a more traditional um, representation of femininity is. Yep. And even though I actually really do like, uh, I think, um, like appearance wise. Yeah. I would say. But in, yeah. But in terms of like my behavior, my voice, my opinions, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my, my swearing and stuff like that. Right. I, I Having don't. your opinion, opinions Exa and voice. Exactly. And being like, quote unquote, disruptive. Right. Um, I don't, I think a lot of men do not find that attractive because they're socialized not to. Right. Absolutely. And so I think, um, right now I'm feeling disheartened because, uh, because of my experiences of, of physical and emotional mm -hmm. abuse, I actually do find myself attracted to, you know, unfortunately like men who are, you know, looking for someone who is like more submissive right. and, um, docile and stuff like that. And, so it's just like a really like, it's just, it's just not a, like there's, there's something that's not worth so, you know, yeah. with my therapist, I'm really working on right. changing like who I am attracted to. Right. But right now I think I just am like, it's a good time to put my energy into, you know, things like this instead yeah. of looking for a partner. And I think, you know, seeing something it's, like so for you, sorry, like, you know, 43, like right. with, you know, you've now been with your partner for several years now, mm. but also like in a place where, you know, are you in a place where you're like, I, I don't want kids or I'm in a place where I don't think I'll have so kids. So I don't, or, yeah. I mean like, I think that, and it's, that's, that's a conversation. I mean, there's, I forget the name of the woman, the author just recently wrote a book about this and she's around my age. We can fact check that later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I've it's I'm acting like speechless, because, even though I have it's it's hard, it's hard to phrase because basically, like I never really, for the most part, felt that urge that my friends seem to have, and I might have pretended to just to fit into the conversation. Totally. But I never really. Like, let's put it this way. When, when I would go to, like, the Short Hills Mall, which was the, the fancy mall we'd go to in high school, because, again, grew up in upper <laughs> white, middle, white upper middle class neighborhood, um, I remember, like, my friends would go and look at the rings at Tiffany's, and it just, like, was, I was not interested. I wanted to look at the clothes at Benetton, because I'm old and, like, it was the 90s. Um, I wanted to look at clothes, but I never had, I never fantasized about 
the wedding ring I was going to get or like the wedding I was going to have. I mean, maybe little stupid yeah. things, more like the party of it and that I wanted to perform some kind of lip sync dance yeah. routine, <laughs> but I can do that without getting married. Yeah. Like, I yeah, don't totally. know why the wedding Oh my gosh, involved. we should do that sometime because Let's just I, that's, do that. that's literally like what I totally relate to that. I mean, I never, I've never thought of like, what's my wedding dress going to look no. like? Who's my wedding party? Like none of that sort of stuff. Never. I mean, the thought of a, a ring, like, a, no. and again, no judgment or anything. Like it's great. Has, rings are beautiful. I'm totally. I'm having people get rings. I, just, I, I can't have nice things anyway. So that's probably yeah. part of it. But I just have never like, I've never desired that. And so I wonder like, like, was I that, did you why. always feel that way? Or did... I'm, I must, I mean, this was high school, right? And like, I don't know why, because my, you know, I won't get too much to my family, but my parents have been happily married since, oh no, <laughs> like 30 years. <laughs> Sorry. I don't like no. 71. <laughs> I can't do math, but like a long time. Yeah. I mean, and I was raised to be independent. I mean, it, it was also the generation in which I grew up compared to like my mother's. Um, but I, it's just, I don't know. Are you, is it na- the nature nurture thing? I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, who knows? Maybe I'm so repressed that there was a time where I did want that. And then I just decided that, no, I'm not because it wasn't happening. I took on this identity of like, I'm getting existential, but like, maybe I just like, you know, dug deep into that identity. But I don't think so because I think if I really did want to get married and have kids, I would have made it happen. Like I made other things happen for myself. So I have the thing I didn't include in my introduction is that something, my biggest passion is in my school as a teacher, aside from, I love us history. I'm just a us history nerd. And I really like to get as many kids as possible to know us history and learn civics and all that stuff is over the past couple of years, I've been, advising a feminist club at my school yeah. and that's really that's my that's one of my number one passions right now it's student run student led so every year we select about three to four officers and so I don't run it like I don't teach any I don't teach it I, I just sit there as a, an adult in the room but I definitely give guidance and feedback to the officers and they have different topics every week and so we just started meeting again this year and the first uh session was just information about like what is feminism because there were a bunch of freshmen who came which was really exciting and we went around the room and some kids didn't know the definition they just wanted to be in the club and because like cool seniors invited them and then some of most of the kids knew the definition but there were definitely some who didn't know and so like a lot of the misconception about feminism is it's you know and I think it came from you know, this idea, and it comes from their families and it comes from our society that like feminist club is where girls sit around bashing men. So if you identify as a feminist, it means that you don't like men. You're telling people that you're a lesbian because that, and then that feeds into the homophobia in our country and right. our, our, in our world, or you are just an angry, just person who's bitter Yeah, and you couldn't get men anyway. But the true definition of it is just like, do you believe that men and women should be treated equal in society? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, Anyone who could say no to that, well, that's a whole, that is a right. whole other conversation. Exactly. But if you say to somebody, do you think that men and women should be considered treated equally in society? Yeah. And don't even get into like right. economically, politically, yeah, yeah, social, yeah, exactly. just like treated equally. And if I ask teenage boys that, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I do believe that. Like, I believe right. that. So I think that it's just like the term know, it's almost like we need is alienating, term. Totally, right? It's the I term. Agree. It's like sort of how to- toxic masculinity, I've talked about this before, but how that is something that men get really reactive yeah. to, even though they don't realize it's hurting them. Right. You know? They're like, you're calling me toxic? Right. No, we're calling the, the system in which you've been raised Exactly, toxic. that women can play into too. What I think that's why we need to lead with, do you think that men and women should be treated equally? Right, exactly. And exactly. if the answer is no, yeah. then, okay, I guess you're not a totally. feminist. So, but, so then let's, yeah. like, I think this is the, a great segue into, like, let's, like, like what what is feminism, right? Because yeah. I think, like you said, yeah, a lot of people have this this interpretation. I mean, people are really reactive to that word. Right. Like, they just, they have images that come up with it. They, like... You know, whenever I tell a guy I'm a feminist, it's like you can see his face like just like kind of like, smirk. yeah, exactly, it's exactly. It's so sad. It's so sad. I know. And um, but I think that if you, uh, yeah, so so we can get into that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and I think like like feminism has has evolved a lot, right, yeah. over history, and we don't have to get into like the the nuances or the minutia of it at no. all. But like like there's been four significant there's been four ways, ways right? I think, yeah. So most people think that I think that what's really crazy about this time is. It's not hyperbole, hyperbole to say we're living through history. Like we're obviously always living through history, right? Totally. But I do feel like politically, socially, and economically, we really are living through 
a significant historical time period. Mm -hmm. And so when you are, it's hard to categorize it, right? So like, that's the one thing about history, you get into these narratives, but when you're living through history, you're not like, right now I'm living during the Great Depression. Like nobody was like, wow, (laughs) since it's the Great Depression, I'm poor, most likely. Or like, ooh, it's the boom, it's the boom time of the 20s. So like, it's only looking back. But right now, I think most people will eventually say that we're living through the fourth, we're in the beginning part of the fourth wave of feminism. But really quickly, like Feminism 101, first wave was 1848 to 1920 yeah. which was 1840 it was like the first Seneca, Seneca Falls convention where women first got together formally and it really it was really based on getting the right to vote because women didn't have the right to vote until 1920 which closed that first wave women were also talking about reproductive rights but that's a whole other conversation right. yeah and I yeah. think that that's like um you know just that is as being such an iconic like you know the first wave of yeah. feminism and everything like that like like it was so important for whatever happened, like that you know, yeah. little conference or whatever, getting people together and being able to talk about it. It's not like they had social media that they were no, sharing this shit on, they but you to be able to yeah. have these conversations and like have the activism for the change to happen. And so right. I think that like that just, you know, as we fast forward to today, yeah. that's why it's so important for us to have Coming these conversations, conversations and come together. That's a good connection. And, like, yeah. You know, like it's like, we wouldn't be like, we need to, things like sexual assault, things like, right. you know, whatever sorts of other issues, abortion, like, you know, we're going to get into and yeah. stuff like, because people are having these isolated, like all, m- m- a lot of them were, you know, having these isolated experiences of like, yeah. wow, if I could only have the right to vote, I could, you know, have a say in our de- this supposed democracy that we live in. Exactly. And when they came together and like Lucretia Mott and all these different people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony, they became friends and worked together, but isolated, no change might have I mean, I don't like to counterfactual, but change yeah, would, exactly. wouldn't have happened the way exactly. it did. Okay, so that was first wave. That's Let's first wave. Second, wave. second wave, a lot of people, most historians believe it started in 63 because of a book, Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique, yeah. um, where she you know, put out the radical idea that you know, there's this systematic sexism in our world that's teaching women that their place is in the domestic sphere right. and and women are, a lot of women are unhappy in that role right. and and three million people bought this book, mostly women, because they identified with this phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, she basically expressed what people were feeling. Like, she's like, you know what? Like, I'm college educated, yeah. and I don't really, I'm not getting the joy of, like, cleaning my kitchen that the magazines are saying totally. that I should have, right? Yeah. And so that that was the second wave, and that really went until the 1980s. That, like, just, yeah. I just feel, like, so sick, like, thinking back. Can you imagine, like, no. living through, like, just, I mean, again, knowing knowing you well and, like, knowing myself right. well and, like, how much joy and stimulation we get out of like ideas and oh, you know, freedom to be able to have these kinds of conversations and like pursue our careers and dreams and like you know neither of us really feeling a strong affinity toward like having kids or you know a, 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 embodying those domestic yeah, and we're not really t- I mean of, not yeah. to, I think I'm gonna assume you're not you don't pride yourself in being a domestic goddess no exactly me neither yeah. like maybe and we would we would be though we'd, we'd, that would be yeah, our role possibly right? possibly and, and look like, I know people who, who do and, and are happy oh yeah I, I think that's um, and, and I'm not saying in a yeah, 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 way. Totally. Like, good for you. No, right. That's no. great. Like, I kind of wish I know. sometimes that I was better at that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. And maybe it's because I have the luxury not to. I right. hear people saying in my head. But, yeah. But, you know. Well, it's, and so anyway, I mean, I yeah, I just like, so you explain that about the, the 60s. And yeah, I'm so, like, so, so the 60s, then. like women in the 60s, yeah. and my mom always tells me this. It's like, if you wanted to live, if you were single and wanted to live in the city, there was, there was a housing just for single women. They couldn't live anywhere else. You can get an apartment on your own if you didn't live in special housing. Really? And women can get credit cards. Oh my god! You can have a credit card. It, yeah. Like you, you had to go from your family home. If you, I mean, women challenged this and didn't do it necessarily. Yeah. But it was really there was you weren't economically sufficient, self sufficient. Yeah. Like it was really hard to be. Yeah. And then you know, out of the out of that second wave, I would say the most like legal like. Um, yeah, like pl- political gains and legal victories occurred in that second wave. So it was 63 to 1980s right. about. And that's where we get the Equal Pay Act mm-hmm. of 73, I think. Uh, Title IX, which is equal funding for women's sports. That came out of that, that time period. Um, education equality. And then, of course, which is much talked about now, Roe v. Wade in 1973, which basically guaranteed women reproductive freedom and you know, that's one of the things that women who are pro-choice are really, and men, are concerned about because there's a chance that even though the new Supreme Court justice 
claims that he, he he's kind of wish he's been wishy washy about his stance on Roe v. Wade, but um, the group that put him on a list as one of the people that Trump should uh, nominate um, the Federal Society, they one of the things that they want is yeah. to overturn Roe v. Wade and give it back to the states to decide. Right. And if oh. like a lot of I can't remember the exact number, but many like a I wouldn't want to say three quarters of the states in America, but more than you realize, what happens is immediately they have laws in the books that if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, women will they'll immediately their state law would also get rid of um, a woman's right to an abortion in that state. And like New York right now is about Cuomo just to in case that happens is putting is is trying is getting there's I don't know when we can vote on it but there's the Reproductive Health Act in New York that is that people need to vote for in case Roe v. Wade gets overturned so women's reproductive rights are not taken away and like that because again I mean obviously it's hard for me to detach myself from my own like biases and experiences like the 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 argument and like the mentality behind that is what uh, about getting rid of like yeah like I, well I think it's just and that's the thing where we need to be open minded I guess there it's that there are people men and women mm-hmm. which is important to keep in mind that truly believe that life starts at conception mm-hmm. and abortion is murder yeah and they believe it like I don't think they don't believe that right. I think totally. they feel really passionate about it yeah and one of the critiques of the Democratic Party and mm-hmm. the women's movement and the mm-hmm. women's march is yeah. that. That group of women who are pro-life are not, are not don't aren't represented by the Women's March. Right. They're not represented by the Democratic Party because the platform is pro pro-choice. Right. So that's definitely a polarizing issue among women that ultimately yeah. gets them to vote Republican conservative because and, of those values. And I try to like understand you know a person's like individual ideas, just to I mean yeah. on so many levels, right? Like. But even so, like, it's like, well, then, so they believe then that they should have control over someone else's choice to do right. that. Like, I, I couldn't understand for, for themselves, like, they wouldn't want it, they yeah. wouldn't choose to, you know, abort a child or whatever, or, like, what they perceive to be a child. Right. Um, but they decide that for everyone else. Yeah. I mean, I guess they just... They believe it's morally wrong, and they therefore... They believe it's morally wrong. They yeah. think it's as morally wrong as me going out on the street and killing someone right now. Right. But that's the only way I can understand it. Yeah, yeah. I personally yeah. don't understand it, because I don't... It fire. It gets me. I'm trying to be open minded, even though I disagree with it. But yeah. the thought that you know, someone can could potentially like if I was living in a state that would not have you know would make abortions illegal, that means that someone else is deciding for me something related to my body and life. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, think about the same people who have that stance about being pro life. They are tend to be people who, yes, maybe through their churches they give to charity and they're giving back. So like I don't want to take that away, but they generally don't think that the federal government should be helping people out financially. Like they're right. against welfare system. Yeah. But if you're forcing someone who can't, who's making a choice they can't afford to, you know, bring that um, pregnancy to, you know, to the end, like they're then are they going to be there for that person once that life. Yeah. comes to being like whether you think it's a conception or not whatever. totally and yeah. i mean that also plays into and we will still finish you know all four waves here yeah. but like that also t- plays into um you know thoughts around like health care and access to birth control right. right right so if a person doesn't have health care or doesn't have access to birth control because it's not that easy to access yeah. for a lot of people right. um you know and you know in a culture that doesn't really um you know, I mean, everything that we've just noticed over the last few weeks, the beliefs mm-hmm. around sexual assault and, you know, right. the, the, the lack of, um, I don't know. I don't know what believing I'm trying to say women? Here. Yeah, the lack of <laughs> believing women. Yeah, like, fuck, in general. I don't even know. Yeah, I, like, I, don't I literally don't know. have the words for it. Like, um, and how that, like, triad, basically, of, like, right. you know, a lack of reproductive rights, lack of access to health care, and then, like, perpetuation of, of rape culture. Yeah. Um, because there's some people who are some people believe in a, you know are, ant, are pro-life I think it's anti-choice but whatever yeah. they consider them pro-life you know except for cases of rape some people are pro-life even when it comes to rape yeah. and that to me is 
I don't understand it. Yeah. So maybe we can ha- talk to them sometime on this. Podcast. Well, no, seriously. Right. I mean, yeah. that's part of like I'm like I, I just want to get it. Like I think I want to understand their understand. mindset. Like I just yeah. because I mean it I, sounds I, like we're being like condescending, but I actually no. legitimately well, want to have that conversation. Well, and also I mean it's like okay, well then how do we make these like greater political decisions? Like like do you weigh the kind of pros and cons? Like if you're looking at it from like an ethics standpoint, and you're looking at like you know I think um, non maleficence, which is like first do no harm, beneficence, mm. then do good, and I can't remember what the other couple ones are. Yeah, after that, those. but yeah. basically like non maleficence meaning first like do no harm right like, i can understand that to a certain point but how are we measuring harm because you can right. look at harm as being like okay you know a harm to this like this unconceived child or the fetus or whatever yeah. um and of course there's psychological harm to i mean right. by all means i've had many clients who've you know who mm. yeah, have had abortions and it's certainly not an easy thing to do for most people um and you know, so there's there's that harm, but then right. if we measure that with the harm of, of potentially like bringing a child to term, raising that child, you know, in a home that does not have like the resources to right. support a, a um, you know a healthy life, like and and yeah. the harm that it would do to the potential mother as a result, like yeah. on so many levels, like I just wonder, it's like how are we measuring harm? Right. Like what is. But I guess that, you know, morally through that lens, they're just, they're just, they're not seeing past that. Right. And they're seeing like, I guess that the death of a human is like being like the The, the the worst, worst thing ever. But then sometimes those same people are for the death penalty. So that's where it gets really confusing. Okay. Yeah. That is. I don't make generalizations. (laughs) I'm like speaking of being condescending. Those people, those people, sorry, people who are pro life, (laughs) not also those people. Sorry. Not sorry. We're human. Sorry. Not sorry. Clearly our bias is coming through. Like obviously. People. Um, so, yeah. okay. So in, and just on that now, where yeah. did birth control come in? Cause I thought that was second wave as well. So that was also, that was second wave okay, because so, the other yeah. big thing was that there were a series of Supreme court cases that, you know, up until this Supreme court case, Griswold versus Connecticut, 63, I think, um, that are 64 around that time. It also, it was illegal to get birth control in some right. States. You yeah. like get in trouble, like find and stuff, right? which is like, there was no abortion. You can have birth control. Oh my God. I mean, got to protect that fetus. Yeah. Anyway, and but that's my bias. And I guess. And smile. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So that's 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 the wave. second wave. Then the then the eighties came about in America. I don't know what it was like in Canada, but like the ster- I mean, th- we're also talking. The other thing we left out of the whole story is like the the racism towards black feminists, which right. which started in the first wave. Totally. Where you know once the Fifteenth Amendment was passed. What was the Fifteenth? Amendment? Fifteenth Amendment basically gave. Um, the right to vote suffrage okay, to black people, okay. like people who have been enslaved in the country, yeah, yeah. black men, um, and but not black women. But yeah, because women didn't have the right to vote. Oh, yet. got it. Okay, okay. And, so but black there was this, were able but, to vote but there started to be women. this like divide within the movement where you see the white supremacy taking over, where a lot some of the white women working for the right to vote didn't want to align themselves with black women, and they were also really outraged that a black man had the right to vote before they did. So you start Got seeing it. these fissures and, yeah. and fractures in the movement. The first wave, the second wave as well, were like, you, it was definitely a middle class, upper middle class white woman's perspective from the feminine mystique. Right. Whereas a lot of black women were like, I don't have the luxury to like, not like whatever work I'm doing or not doing. Right. right. That was like bell hooks or whatever. Yeah, like, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and what was the, I mean, cause that was sort of the, um, how we're, we're looking at like racism versus white privilege, like, right? Right. Like that's the, yeah, or white supremacy know, or white supremacy, yeah. excuse me, versus like today, you know, looking at this whole like misogyny versus, versus male, male supremacy. supremacy. So, yeah. so yeah, so yeah. So I left that out, which is awful, but so then getting to the third wave though. So like the eighties, that's when you started. So I think that there's, you still see the yeah. effects of that. Right. So like in the eighties, the word feminist started having that that connotation okay. of man hater, bravo. Even though they didn't in nineteen sixty eight there was a protest against the um, Miss America contest in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and women were throwing away certain tokens and thing things in, from like a like a Playboy magazine and various other objects that yeah, were yeah. oppressing women. But then there was this leg- this myth that was passed around that they were actually burning their bras, which they were not. Yeah. But in the eighties, it started being like, oh, if you're a feminist, you're bra burning right. burner. You're a lesbian, which that homophobic right. language. 
language. Your this was still oh this, this was third wave and this is so this is right before the third wave. Okay, Carter, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this that, was also yeah. like when women were like, I'm gonna not gonna shave my armpits, like I'm gonna stop removing my right. body so hair, like it would just I'm be, stop wearing yeah. makeup. I don't want to conform to what. And that was the second expecting. wave too. Like yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm right. I'm not gonna conform to this feminine yeah. stereo standard. But then the third wave is starts like in 1990, 1991, which is really relevant because it was around basically. Um, it started off with the Anita Hill. Which was almost, it was an October 5th. It was almost, wow. Like, it was almost. <laughs> Let's can't do the math. math can't do <laughs> many decades ago. Yeah. To the almost date. To the date. 30 years ago. Yeah, Thank but you. But not quite. But not, <laughs> right. Which, it's like 27, I think. Don't have a calculator. <laughs> yeah. But it was a while ago. But it was 1991. Which was, yeah. <laughs> I can't even do the math. It's 27. Awesome. It's 27. Yeah. We yeah. need to get better at math. We're just becoming stereotypes for <laughs> <laughs> women are good at math sometimes <laughs> not us but you start that that struck off the whole, a whole new wave of feminism because so many women started talking about the sexual harassment they were experiencing yeah. in the workplace because women were entering the workforce but they were right. contending with the you know the white male supremacy in the office you know even in the starting in the 60s and 70s into the 80s and that the, the, and the 92 was called the year of the the woman because 24 women won seats in the house of representatives, three in the Senate, not you know, not as many in the Senate. But women were inspired from by Anita Hill, and they were right. like, "Why can't I? I'm running for office." Like yeah, I don't because yeah, awesome. it was a bunch of white men right. asking her these really personal, inappropriate yeah. questions about her harassment, and looking at her like she was crazy and just trying to bring a, a good man down. And so the interesting thing about the third wave that we may or may not be in, I think that we're probably in the fourth wave now. But the third wave. And where you start seeing the talk talks about intersectionality, where right. you know the idea of you know your experience as a black woman versus a white woman in society is really different. Right. So you can't just talk about your experience as a woman. There's other different um, parts of your life that um, intersect, different forms of oppression that. Inter- yeah. So no. Also yeah. though. Um- I mean, my understanding was like part of third wave was also women, like kind of Madonna and stuff. And, yes. and like a lot of the punk rock women who were like, I am still wearing makeup. I can still yeah. like, um, embrace my femininity and be a feminist. Like, Absolutely. I, like, and just because I'm wearing a short skirt doesn't mean I'm asking to be raped. Exactly. And yeah. that's, and that's the whole riot girl movement. So that's right. where you start seeing like, I mean, every like whole and L7 and all these riot girl bands. I mean, yeah. some people felt like whole, whatever, like the, the, the riot girl bands like L7 and I'm not going to start beef, but like they <laughs> often <laughs> criticized Courtney Love thinking that she was, you know, bringing that to the mainstream, but it be, did become a part of the mainstream yeah. culture, that riot girl movement. Whereas like in the second wave, women, they, women of that gender females wanted to be called women they didn't yeah. they wanted to be they didn't want men to, they wanted men to stop calling them girls right. whereas in the third wave they it, the part of the movement was like we're gonna reclaim that word okay. and own that word and yeah i can be a girl i can be feminine um i can i can dress sexy for myself not for the male gaze yeah and if you have a problem with it then that's your problem and right. i can be sexy and still be a feminist. So was that when just the idea around like objectification became like yes. a real part of the conversation or yeah. was that always around? I think I think it became well objectification in the second wave was a rejection of that and part of it was not dressing for the male gaze. Got it. Whereas the third wave maybe in a way to because it was there was this backlash to the feminist movement in the eighties, it was yeah. like we don't want to be who knows how much of it was a part of the movement where they're like, we don't want to be seen as you know, shrill, man hating women with their head shaved and you know no makeup no pretty clothes whatever so they started just saying like anything that a woman wants to wear and say and do is fine Got and it. feminist because that's it's it as long as it's a woman's doing it yeah. and she wants to and it makes her happy if she wants to be a stripper that's good for her like yeah. no judgment sex yeah, yeah. worker like there was less judgment around that stuff and that was the third wave so that was the 90s and like base 90s 2000s but then I think that a lot of people believe that we're in the fourth wave Mm -hmm. Um, and feminist Jessica Valenti in 2009 made the um, statement that she thinks that the the fourth wave was already happening and it was online and in my experience just with my students I don't know if I mean not in 2009 I didn't talk to them about it but I definitely think that my students today are a part of the fourth wave which Mm -hmm. is you know intersectionality is a big part of it but you know um, it's a queer sex positive 
trans inclusive, body positive, and it is digitally driven. Like I think a lot of the information, all the information that my students have about feminism, how they define it, comes from what they're looking at on blogs mm -hmm. and Twitter and Instagram. And I think that for sure, when historians look back, they'll see Me Too, Time's Up, obviously the recent um, Supreme Court nomination as the beginning of definitely we're in, I think we're in the fourth wave right now right. most people would say okay. the women's march the yeah, response to yeah, Trump yeah. the pussy hats I think that will end up being put on in that part of the timeline right so we're as I said in the beginning I think we are living through history yeah so I mean I've left a lot of out of this no I mean this is a great it's summary. An overview and yeah. I think like so the fourth wave then essentially is like you said I mean being online like it's like what has been accessed in the conversations I've had through Instagram and Facebook and right. you know being able to have things like, I mean the women's march like that'd be that wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened exactly that. without yeah. that kind of stuff, right? And just even, yeah. and even like the empowerment to speak out, like even just noticing how many women are speaking out or sending me messages right now on Instagram about right. their sexual I see those. assaults and things, like, and sharing with each other and, and like with each other just exactly. Like when Alyssa Milan, so Me Too, um, that whole movement started a year ago, and I mean that all happened online. It's like yeah. strangers just sharing their experiences. Totally. And I feel like now it's been escalated even more you see it more into in microphones like not just on twitter it's it's what's really interesting actually like we've gone full circle where the women's movement you know the first wave of the feminist movement started at the seneca falls conference you know in an actual space and then this new wave that i think we're in did start online right yeah. it started with people just sharing their experiences but then because of what was going on with the supreme court women are on the streets again and just right. like also because of Donald Trump and his election and totally. what he represented to so many women they took to the streets yeah. so I think there's something kind of now I'm less depressed it's yeah. kind of inspiring to think that women in many ways like the uh, the digital um, interchange got them back on the streets again right. interacting with each other yeah. in person and and like how I mean for people because I think one of the the criticisms that I hear a lot of is like oh, you know, women have taken things too far. And right. they're just like, it's like, you know, they are equal. There is, there's no such thing as pay, yeah. the, wage, the wage gap, pay right. equality. You know? They're making that up. They're the, exaggerating. Right, it. exactly. And, or, or the pink tax or whatever the latest thing it, is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or even like, um, you know, um, transgender people shouldn't be asking for like, different pronouns or we shouldn't be so sensitive in institutions right. around like everyone like gets language triggered or trigger warning, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, so, so why is it important for us to keep keep fighting. I mean, I think like this past week has been very, I think know, it's pretty past clear. Months have been quite clear, yeah. but, but you know, I mean, even, even like, like I want to believe that the sexual assault conversation, it's like, it's so clear actually, but let's go into that. Like yeah. why, why is it so important for us to keep having conversations around sexual assault? Be I mean, for so many reasons, I think the main reason is that I think it people, I think that so many women, well, I think it's all based, I think it goes back to how sex education is rolled out in this country and I, I don't know about Canada but I'm gonna guess it's probably about the same where um, I was actually talking to my students about this in our feminist club on Thursday um, and I'm answering your question but just it has to do with consent right yeah. because I think that for so long um, sex education is taught really like it's been sculpted by men yeah but then you know not really educating women and men about all the different areas of sexual interactions and the emotional parts of it and that you know if, and most of my students learn about sex they don't talk to their parents about it so they learn about it from tv movies right yeah. and if you watch most movies even today it's like you meet someone and it's very rare that you that in the movie it's like they meet and then they're having sex so right. like if that's how they're learning about sex it's like well i guess when you meet a guy and then like you both think each other attractive like that's the next step totally. right and i think then if we also don't teach them about consent yeah. then then sexual assault they're just it, it's going to happen totally. and they're not going to even realize that that's happening to well them. not to mention porn i mean oh, like right like I, and again i, I I've just never really gotten into porn. Like, I don't know. It's strange though. Like, I mean, and I, that's where I feel like I'm a conservative where I feel so, and you know, with all due respect to people in the porn industry who make their living off of that. And yeah. I'm, it sounds judgmental, but to me, I just feel like the porn industry has been just so, so awful for women. The way men 
learn that's where most men i think learn about sex totally. right i've always had a really big problem with the yeah industry. and yet it's so conflicting because again as like a feminist who you know wants to support sex workers and women, right it's it's very challenging because it's like as much as i want i support the profession the choice is totally right but then the impact of the media how it impacts other women it's right. really hard to negotiate that dissonance right like right so like even though the women who are in those roles a lot of them feel like they're being empowered, although so many times years later yeah. you find out that they've been abused and yeah, addicted yeah. to drugs and all that stuff. But like, you know, or they're victims of abuse and they're perpetuating their abuse right. by the, the films that they're in. But for the most part, I think that it ultimately does a disservice to both men and women because it, 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 it I think that it like, there's been a lot of articles about this. It's not a new idea, but I think it does affect the way the expectations that men have with women and sexual experiences. Totally. So if we're not taught about it in school and films either just the people meet and then they don't show the sex but then they're in bed together so you yeah. assume they had sex. Or men are watching these porn films. I sound like an old lady. Like this <laughs> the porn, porn films. The pornography yeah. films. I don't know. Like, And I think that looping it back to sexual assault, like, I mean, I think that a lot of times our culture for so long up until now women aren't realizing that they have been victims of sexual assault. Yeah. And I know for me personally, like, okay, so having experienced multiple forms of sexual assault, including rape, mm -hmm. and then also having experienced, you know, a lot of unwanted sexual experiences, right. like, like the one you described right. there, all of them have been very painful in Absolutely. different ways. Yeah. Um, I think what can be more challenging with things where it wasn't a clear, like, I said no and they did it anyway, is that there's this, like, confusion in the process. I mean, right. there's confusion anyway. Right. There's confusion in all of it. Of but course. I know for me personally, like, when I compare my various different experiences that I've had that have all been really, like, painful and shitty, um, the ones that have been harder to talk about where mm. I felt more shame have been the ones where I've believed I've somehow consented through, like, yes. I guess... Implicit, um, yeah, exactly, like an implicit yeah. consent, or I've, 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 and then I feel the shame, and I'm like, yes. how did this happen? And I'm so confused, and I, and I just blame myself. Right. Whereas, like, you know, the, the, you know, at least the one example that I can think of that it that I would absolutely identify as rape, where I said no multiple times, mm. like it was as traumatic as that was. Like I was able to talk about that with people because I felt like I could because I felt. Like, oh, well, this definitely was rape. Whereas, right. like, the other ones, it's like, well, wait, what was that? Wasn't that? Like, where's you know, the line? Exactly, where where's the line? you didn't want. Totally. And, and I think that that's why when Dr. Ford testified and then said, I know, like, 100% it was Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah. Like, 100%. And I think what I'm struggling with, and I've definitely gotten to some, like, Facebook, I'm not above Facebook yeah. fights still, even though I keep telling myself to stop. But like when I'm feeling so raw, I jump in. I, know, I was like, I can't just yeah. let this go on, you know, and never end up convincing anyone. But like, there's so many people. Let's not even talk about the people who were celebrating last night and having their hashtag Brett beers, women oh God. and men. But like, there's so many people out there who are saying, I just don't believe her. Yeah. And it's like, so you don't believe or you believe that something bad happened to her yeah but you don't believe who she's she's saying with a hundred percent certainty right like tearing her life apart yeah they don't believe her and yeah. I, I i don't know where i think that somehow does can i think that somehow does link back to um like why we need to talk more about sexual assault and talk about the different like it's not just totally. rape right yeah it's 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 Obviously, rape is the worst form of it, but I think it does go back to that. We need to start having conversations about consent. Yeah. yeah. And people just don't even talk totally. about it. Totally. And, and sex positivity. And I think, like, part of the. I don't think. Yes, I mean, it is true that there is a very small percentage of false rape claims. Yes. I don't think those would exist if we were more sex positive in our culture. Absolutely. And because, you know, that's usually a react. Like, I mean, maybe it, it, there's like a vindictive nature to it, but a lot of the time it just comes out of shame and a person yep. not wanting to admit, you know, that they consented to sex with someone because there's mm. so much shame around that as a woman. So if we right. actually made sex oh, that's a really good in point. our culture, you know, more like safer and more celebrated and took the stigma away from it and the slut shaming away from right. it. I actually think that there would be, we'd eradicate false rape I, I think you're entirely right. and then we would believe women, you know, more. And right? I think that's something else that people have talked about, but it, it makes it more, it, it makes it more complicated is the drinking culture around mm -hmm. sex and dating. Totally. And I think it has to do with our, you know, puritanical, yeah. um, feelings about, and it's, 
you know, not just puritanical, but just our general society's uncomfortable unco- obsession with, but then also at the same time, complete uncomfortable uncomfortability is that a word discomfort Discomfort. that's the word it's the word good word better (laughs) word only because I use it all the time (laughs) the discomfort with sex and also the obsession right it's like this weird paradox exactly and I think that there's so much drinking that there's the binge drinking that it sounds like I sound like an old person the binge drinking that goes on in college and high school and I think a lot of it is whatever people like to drink and it's fun but I think there is something tied into especially for women that they feel like they need to be drunk to make it an excuse to have a sexual totally. experience with a guy, like one hundred percent, like you know, the and I de- definitely have friends who've, you know, decided, you know, or whatever they're they're alcoholics and decided and got sober, and it was harder for them to date because yeah. so much of dating involves drinking. Yeah, and you know, again, I said like I'm being judgmental, but I think we have to talk about that yeah. because again, you're not it's it's not your fault if you were drunk and got raped ever yeah. you were assaulted it wasn't your choice totally. but why there's so much drinking I mean yeah. it's going it's been especially oh my we were saying especially these parties in the 80s but yeah. like I think people are drinking less now but I think someone made a joke online that's because teenagers are just on Instagram and yeah. like not seeing each other to, right. to drink and that might change things yeah. but there is so much a lot of this is, is I think it is tied up in the shame around sex the, the shame around around wanting to have a sexual experience and then feeling like ashamed about it so you're going to drink and blame it on that but yeah. then it creates this really confusing interaction when you're both drunk totally right and totally. not thinking straight and and you know I mean that's a place where again I mean it's it's really challenging because I guess you could argue that like if if a man is too drunk to like get an erection then he right. can't rape a woman right, right. um but he can but try to. he can try and like there's still you know there's just it, they can yeah, do other I mean, things that the woman didn't want absolutely and right? so it's like I mean I guess we don't we don't get drunk and, and murder people for the most part we don't right. get drunk and That's do really other crimes point. so like you know if we can instill it in people like young enough like in some ways it seems like the narrative is get drunk and then you have permission right. whereas instead we should be like 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 the way that for me when I'm drunk I mean I don't know how this is for most people but when yeah. I'm drunk I'm like I definitely can't drive. You know, like, it's yeah, like, it's like right. I, you know, you're like, right. no, you can't drive. And that's so what ingrained like, in us exactly. only because of a massive campaign Exactly. In the 80s, so it's right? like, okay, I'm drunk. I definitely like, have to be extra careful to get consent right. from this person right. or, you know, by and, or and, give it. And or whereas, sex. like, it's also just the way sex is, you know, it's, I don't know if kids, kids still talk about bases. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if they do. Uh, I mean, I don't know. But it I, used I to be it. bases, yeah. right? right? First, second, third base. And like that will that in itself, and I definitely heard this somewhere. I didn't come up with it. Yeah. Like it makes it a game, right? Yeah, so like, totally. It's like I scored. Yeah. I scored. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Right? So like how are you? Yeah, like the that conquest. conversation. And, and I mean that. that, I mean, we'll maybe get into this, but that also gets into like power over women and right. stuff like that. Now, so but something that comes up for me when you were mentioning um, women feeling the need to get drunk, right. I wonder how to, to how much this plays into um, women's bodies and feeling confident and empowered enough to have oh sex, God, right? Absolutely. So like we, I mean, you and I as people who both have histories of eating disorders, yeah. as does like some exorbitant amount of women, I don't even want to throw out a statistic because they're not right. like, it's You know, so you'll many. say like five to 20%, yeah. it's way higher than it, that. Because and a lot of people don't admit it, to it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And even if you don't have like a clinical eating disorder, you have right. problems with food. And men right. do too. But like, yeah. you know, I remember, um, and this actually plays into the porn conversation too, but I remember reading a book and I can't remember what it was called, but it was this woman who, who'd done some interviews with women who were in their like, you know, in, in, teenagers about their first sexual experiences. Mm. And one of the women that she interviewed or the young, the girls that she interviewed who was maybe 14 or so, she asked her, well, how was your first time? And she yeah. said, um... I think it was good. I think I looked okay. Oh my God. And it was like, she had, she like, again, was so focused on how she looked, like how she performed, you know? And, um, and so I think, I mean, and I can certainly relate to this personally. I mean, it's definitely like, I, I'm not there anymore, but there was a time in my life where I was so self-conscious about my body. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go on top having sex. Right. But I also like, I couldn't have sex sober, like, you know, unless it was with my boyfriend, you know, right. But like anyone else. Honestly, I think that, if we were to pull women and talk to them honestly about it, yeah, we it would be actually not surprising, but but still shocking yeah. that a large majority of women feel that way. Totally, I think, and especially on a, a first date or you know, yeah. someone who's not necessarily a, it's a long term boyfriend. Absolutely, and so that's going to be an area too where like drinking is perpetuated or some sort of substance use. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this also comes back to like the patriarchy, you know, and right. comes back to the expectation that women are supposed to look a certain way because we're ornamental or because right. we're here to 
fulfill these expectations for what a woman should be, which is, you know, having X, this type of body based on media, based on the porn industry, you know, right. based on now Instagram and stuff like right. that and what continues to be perpetuated that we actually buy into through like diet culture and our um, beliefs that our self-worth is very attached to our, our size, which right. it, sure. it, you know, our value in our society, it, it is like, it's not an illusion. I mean, it's not true if you look at it like like factually, no one is worth something else because of their body size. But right. if we look at you know people who are favored in society, you know, pass over, just the discrimination, the yeah. weight bias that actually occurs, fat shaming and stuff like that. Oh, those yeah. things are very real. And and who gets jobs and who doesn't, and who gets promoted, who you see on TV and totally. who you don't see on TV. Totally. And it right. affects. I mean, it affects all genders, but it affects women way. Oh, absolutely. To, you know, I mean, it's it's so. So I think that that's just like another place in which like the personal is political. We are affected by yes. these systems. We are affected. Um, and you know, any woman, I, it breaks my heart because I see so whenever I'm working, I specialize in eating disorders. And whenever I'm working right. with a client, one of the ne- really like necessary things for, um, recovery in my opinion is to identify, you know, with a, a more feminist organization or like mm. ideology and to recognize how their, um, you know, they're controlling of their body or they're trying to manipulate their body into a smaller size is actually representation yeah, of like making a, themselves of, of smaller. oppression. Yeah. Making themselves yeah. smaller. And then also like using their brain power to diet and oh exercise, god. which takes so, as we know, it takes so, so much, much fucking brain power, oh my god. um, to diet and exercise. And, and, you know, also like when a person is starving, their brain's not functioning yeah, not at their functioning. optimum capacity. No. And so if we think of like how many women in this world, if they weren't dieting and focusing on oh, the shit, God. what we could accomplish. Right. And so this so is just another place wasted. where like, yeah, where diet culture or wellness culture is right. really like, again, it's, you know, run by men and who's an aware, like we have these things called unconscious biases. Right? right. And so we, when we grow up in a system where there is like racism and homophobia and sexism and ableism, all the isms kind of like baked into our culture yeah. in these ways where we're getting these messages constantly. Like we are going to, um, uh, perpetuate. Yeah. And biases, make it a part right? of our mindset. And I remember once a, an example you shared with me that was resonant that I still share with people is like, you know, you and I can like walk into a, a Starbucks bathroom and, yes. and use the bathroom be like, Hey, yeah. can I use the bathroom? I always do that. You or, know, like, or like, even like a nice fancy restaurant. Exactly. Like no one cares. No, exactly. No yeah. one cares. Can I use your, can I use right. the bathroom? Right. Or, um, or the one that I often use too is like, I'm working on my laptop in a coffee shop mm-hmm. and if I'm sitting there and like, there's, you know, a white girl with a yoga mat next to me, I just go and use the bathroom. I just oh, leave yeah, my laptop fine. on. It's yeah. fine, right? Yeah. If I, the black dude in the hoodie is sitting next to me, I'm way more likely to be like, oh, hey, other stranger, you know, who's not the black dude in the hoodie, can you right. watch my laptop for me? Without and even realizing Without even realizing it. it. And then yeah. it hits me and I'm like, oh, fuck. Right. That was absolutely my unconscious biases, right? right? And so that's I mean, a good way to explain it to people, right? Or yeah. like, you know, I'll have a client who's who's uh, like um, Native American, and they'll graduate from university, and I'm like throwing them a fucking like I'm like so I'm oh, like God, right. this is amazing, yeah, you know, like I'm like well. Would I mean, you say that for any, right, right. In the I, same that's, way. that's exactly. I, I my surprise around that right. event is a representation of like some of my biases and racism and stuff. Right. And I think it's really, I mean, it's so hard to face. I mean, I definitely in the feminist club that, that I'm an advisor, I'm a teacher advisor. Yeah. I've definitely had moments in that club that were really fucking hard for me where, yeah. you know, the, and they're, they're teenagers too. So they're, they're just testing out their theories and they sometimes right. can be more extreme and you know, I'll hear them be like, I hate all white feminists. And like, and I'm sitting there like, that's, me like I can't help it that I'm a white feminist. Right. Okay. So they're meaning like yeah. white feminists, like a feminist is white, not white yes. feminist is in the term. Or of, like I of, hate white people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and they're teenagers, yeah. right? So like they're just expressing mm-hmm. how they feel, and I can totally. understand that, right? Totally. Like if they're all their experiences with white people, including teachers, yeah. you know, who are white, have have been oppressive mm-hmm. and negative. They're in a safe space in that club I can't be like you guys I'm here too because totally. then it defeats the whole purpose yeah and then I'm being a performative ally like I just want to have them say good things about right, us, right? exactly and that gets into like white fragility our biases are called out on like not being inclusive not um being true allies not right. practicing intersectionality um not and, being mindful yeah. of different experiences yeah and, and, and or maybe like and... fucking up because we do yeah. you know like if someone had called me out and I'm like no I just you know like I didn't it's like, mean it that way right I didn't mean that way getting defensive exactly exactly yeah. those are all forms of white fragility and like so being able to be like yeah like 
just like what you're doing. I mean, like, first of all, you're allowed to feel that way. I get right. it. And I'm not going to be reactive and take it personally. Right. Um, which I think, you know, it, we but can... it's hard not to start feeling defensive. Of so like if I'm feeling that way and I'm surrounded by this more than maybe someone else that I grew up with. Yeah. I mean, I guess that comes down to like, how do we have these conversations? Because I definitely have gotten to a point, but then I go, I go through phases of like, it's not even worth it. It's not worth engaging in these discussions. Mm -hmm. But then again, I'm like, then I'm just being a, you know, a, totally. a fake ally or whatever. Yeah. But then on the other hand, you know, I don't know how to have that conversation without getting really angry or sounding really condescending. How do I engage in that conversation yeah. without coming across as judgmental? Also, you know, making it worse, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. T totally. And I think that that's like, I mean, there's a question mark there for me too that I, I have not yet to remove because that is something that I really want to do. And that's, you know, part of what influences me to have this or inspires me to have these yeah. conversations is like, how do we open up dialogue around this? in a way um, that's respectful and, right. you know, passes the mic appropriately, like to the people who deserve to hold it. And by that, I mean, you know, people who have experienced some level of oppression and discrimination. Mm -hmm. And I would say beyond, I mean, I think there is a space right now with everything going on for the quote unquote, when I say white feminists, I don't mean like white feminists, like feminists who ignore intersectionality. I just mean feminists the, who, who are white, to, happen to be who white. happen to be white. Yeah. Um, unfortunately in the same way that I like to interview um white men with mental health struggles because mm -hmm. people listen to them and there's like yeah. only there's like this way of it's like you can almost like it's like a gateway you know and right. so in some ways it's like if this can be a gateway and it's like well if we can be allies as white women you know for someone who would be completely discredited because not, of the color not, of the skin. Yeah, exactly ignored completely isn't that is that better i mean i i, I think, I think it's, better. it's better than not like i think it's better than I not think it's, yeah it's worse to just stay in your own right world but and... i think it's like really important to be super humble and super yeah. aware that we don't know our shit i mean we do right. we know our shit to a certain point and and also like i was reading somewhere that was like don't say i hate white people if someone shares an experience and i've done that yeah and I and I'm like I'm I'm an asshole, but yeah. now I know better. Like right. I'll be like, oh, I hate white people, and they're like, well, you're white, right? So, like, that's such an easy thing for you to say, and you're you benefit from white supremacy, right? Like I totally. think it's really hard for, that's such for a good people point. to understand they benefit yeah. from white supremacy, whether they mean to or not. Exactly. That's like it can blow your mind if you think about it. Yeah. And it's not to make people feel guilty; it's to make them just start seeing the world different. Right. Right. Like we just that 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 restaurant like i told my students that like yeah do you guys know that if i'm on the upper east side like i can walk into the fanciest restaurant and just say hey i really need to use the bathroom or like i'm looking for someone and yeah. no one will stop me exactly whereas if they tried that like for the most part they would be like excuse me totally. you definitely don't have reservations here so go away. totally and that's where i'm like oh i'm completely free it, to do that it's right? such a, yeah and and you know and i think like so tying this back to um some more of those unconscious biases like one again being relevant with this the, the sexual assault conversation yeah. um and just like body image and weight bias and stuff like that everything is the one around like the internalized um male supremacy right so that's something where it's like okay like we as as white people need to recognize our privilege and just see the how the world operates differently for us yeah um same thing for for men and so yes. it's like what we're asking in this conversation it's, it's like it's not we're, we're not saying like feel all this guilt and like we hate right. you and, and shame around it i know i feel like a lot of the the guys i go out with because i have this conversation often it's like well i've worked really hard to get right where I am. you know like right. i've the when they i didn't come from all this money right when they hear privilege they're they think just financially or they think yes. just class or social status like and so when we say privilege and i imagine you know if people have been listening this long they're probably going to know this already but yeah. like when we say privilege we're talking about layers of privilege right, right. so you know oppression Not theory is all about like you know, if you have to, like, for you and I as two white women here who are straight and cisgender and able-bodied and thin right. privilege and everything, like, English-speaking, like, highly right. educated, like, we have all layers of privilege except for what we have one layer of oppression as being women, right? right. Let's say that we were, we were women of color as well, then we have two layers of oppression. Right. We're women of color who are in, you know, wheelchairs, like, right. we have three layers, right? So, right, and that's the whole intersectionality exactly. that people talk about. Exactly, and so... Um, yeah, so I think, like, oftentimes people, they just don't take that into account. They think it's like, oh, well, the American dream is to just work hard and overcome anything. It's a capitalist anything. model. Right, but right. they don't realize that, like, I mean, if you apply for a job and your name is not white-sounding, your resume may they very easily not, get they passed over. They might not over. look at it. Exactly, right. exactly. They'll have certain ideas about you. So I think that, you know, the problem is that I think that 
for so there's it, not to get I mean not to get into an anti-capitalist diatribe but it's become more and more difficult even for yeah. people with economic privilege right to like there's less and it feels like there's less and less spots at that private school and less and lots totally. less opportunities to get your kid on the right yeah. softball team when they're young or baseball team. I don't even know what goes on because right. again, I'm not in that world, but I do think that there is an anxiety among people who are upper yeah. middle class even, and there's, they're not in the 1% or the yeah. 0.01%. So it's hard for them to feel like they can share that spot right. when, when there's no spot for them. Right. Or they get really pissed off about like affirmative action stuff. Yeah. And like, How do you have that conversation with, with people and make them realize that like, it is hard to say that like mm-hmm. you should, we should share more of opportunities because totally. we'll all be better off. Well, it's hard to make people see that when yeah, they don't feel like they have anything to and, share. And I sometimes wonder like, you know, I wonder if partially it's be- and I know that like, there are some criticisms around the number of women who are speaking up right now because it's like a white woman who's come forward and stuff right. like that. Um, but either way, like I think we can probably agree women tend to be like more empathic and more intuitive. And like, again, right. there is like a hormonal piece to that and whatnot. And there's probably an evolutionary piece and so, yeah. you know, we're caregivers and, but um, like, I think for me, especially having been raised, you know, Canadian and, and relatively socialist and whatnot, like for me, it's just, oh, that's interesting. It, it just goes without saying that I'm like, well, I was born with all this privilege. If I had been born without it, I would want my neighbor to, you know, care yeah. and contribute to like my well being and recognize that like they have it better than me and want to even the playing field. See, that's like, not how it is here. Like everyone, yeah. it, it's just not a part of the mindset. It's right. Not a part of the Which I find so fascinating. Like, and again, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying every Canadian feels that way. Like, no, but that's I, it's just not a part of the culture. Right. Like, it's. It, I mean, I think what's interesting is that more and more young people identify as democratic socialists now. Right. And I think that in many ways that, that kind of makes sense because like this is the first generation that is not uh, since World War II, every generation in America has done better than the yeah. previous. And this is the first time where it's not like that. Totally. And so it makes sense that younger people are saying or, or questioning capitalism because right. it's not working for them. It's, yeah. it's only working for the people at the very top exactly. or the ones who are lucky enough to and hardworking enough to get up there. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, like, is it actually getting better? Because, like, I hear it's actually getting worse. You know, it's like, you'll hear, right. like, oh, well, the, the economy's up. The, yeah, the yeah. economy's up, and unemployment's at its lowest in however many years, and at the same time, like... I don't think people are the, feeling that. Yeah, no, and it seems like the the um, disparity between, like, the rich and the poor is, is just getting yeah, like, bigger, but I don't know if that's... Could, it's because, sure. yeah, I mean, it's like baby boomers could buy house. You know, it's all inflation adjusted but I think it was more affordable to buy home yes they were dealing with like the looming threat of the Russians attacking us but then again that's a threat again right we just don't think it's a threat now because the president benefited from that but that's my opinion but yeah. that's a different <laughs> podcast <laughs> we won't even go there so and, and something just going back to it because I know um part of the reason I brought up that internalized biases conversation was because I want to call out in my within myself yeah. my own um male supremacy my own yes. you know, internalized misogyny like the Me places too. where I hear other women tell their stories of sexual assault and my immediate place that I might go is mm. to victim blame, right? Yep, we all do that. We well, all we do it. To. And you know, there is that like this. Well, we don't all do it, right. but it's, it's something it, that happens. It, it's very than, easy to right? Yeah. Because it is perpetuated through media, but there's also something called the just world hypothesis where like, What's that? we want to believe that like we live in a just world, ah. right? Where people, where good things happen to good people, bad things happen to mm. bad people. And so when these types of things happen and we see something that feels like a, a bad thing happening to a good person, we want to make sense of it so we have a sense of control because otherwise it's very anxiety provoking to live in a world where bad things can happen right. to people, at any right? time. At any time. So, so, you know, we'll say, oh, well, it's because she was wearing the short skirt. Well, it's because, you know, she must've been asking for it. Well, you know, it's because she was drunk, she, she was drunk or she walked down the dark alley right. or whatever. And, you know, it's been really like being fully transparent. I mean, when this, even with my own personal experiences, like mm. I have definitely, I've taken a lot of blame in my own personal experiences and what was so hard for me and like not reporting certain things and whatnot was, um, the only reason I wanted to pretend what I even considered reporting or anything like that was like, well, what about the other women that yeah. this person might victimize? Right. Yeah. And it wasn't about me. I wasn't like, I need justice. I was like, I'm fine. I'm okay. Like I right. have really good support. Um, but it was more like, I want to protect other women because I know that they may not have that kind of support. Right. And I still feel a lot of guilt around everyone not reporting for that reason. Um, but because I've continued to negotiate some of my own trauma with that mentality, mm-hmm. 
even up until like the past couple of weeks and I've actually really tried to stay away from the news as much as possible because yeah, I don't find it serving for me it's just yeah, so triggering yeah um but you know I, I, I stay like informed enough right um and just like hearing people's like perspectives and stuff like initially I was kind of like oh, okay you know I can kind of see both oh, okay right, sort like, of who knows if she were right yeah. I was sort of like in it I wasn't really right. taking a strong opinion and then this past week like I'm not kidding I had like 15 women clients it was I've, I've never had this before that's who were like so deeply affected because every single fucking one of them has a story or an experience of sexual assault. And like, it was just like the most like painful, humbling experience. And I felt like, fuck, like I continue to walk around with this like male supremacy and I do I know that I do. And so, and so many women do. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, and it's, it's our niche. It's just the idea that going, and there's other, other people have made, you know, allegations of sexual assault and wrongdoing with Brett Kavanaugh but like you know we it's our society tends to err on the side of believing the man still look what happened I mean exactly there's like yeah. no reason like her testimony was so believable that even people who didn't want to believe her believed her right. yeah but we do tend to believe absolutely women, and men over women yeah it's and just I like even like to. that's what i'm noticing i mean i'm i'm trying not to be stay out be on instagram too much over this because like it's very easy for me to get super triggered and feel like this yeah. i must defend like myself yeah. or this person or whatever yeah. and um but that's like what i'm noticing actually from even like a lot of women is right. you know, how could you destroy this man's family da, 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 or how could like this yeah. person destroy this man's it's family it's an allegation yeah she can prove you it you know innocent until yeah. proven guilty and um and i think like that's the that's the one area where like if, if there's going to be an ask from all of this you know if people could just like recognize and understand and not shame themselves for yeah. having I mean okay so yes I think there's like a healthy level of shame about recognizing your internalized mm-hmm. racism maybe that's how you have those conversations right. that are like how do we yeah find some place to yeah. have you think about this in a different way like totally. and who knows when it's going to happen like when I teach and again I still need to be taught many things like yeah. I don't want to come across as condescending like there's a bunch of I don't know right but like I feel like sometimes you learn things gradually so like yeah it, you have the, you see that you think about it you disagree yeah. with it and eventually it comes up and yeah. you see it somewhere else and you start thinking differently and right. who knows that's I know, my and positive I think, side yeah, yeah and I think like like so first step of course like becoming aware of our own biases and stuff like that and that's right. great but yes I want us to be able to move outside the silos and the echo chambers and like right. I think there is that sp- I mean and honestly like this is like I know I keep coming back to dating yeah. but I kind of feel it sometimes I'm like I think part of my like mission on this earth or my like could be. It's purpose just, is to just go on a shit ton of dates instead and of, have these conversations yeah, instead of canvassing just, for like, candidates you're just canvassing for like yeah, these ideas exactly like, and I'm just like hey like, just, just something to think about and you know not every time a person is right. like you're right but there have actually been a lot of conversations where guys are like you know whether it's just to appease me or, or you know get my pants or something I don't know but like right. Who knows? Um, but, but listen maybe eventually they yeah they're like you know what that, like, I've never thought of it that way and so I think it sometimes like us just like getting out there and like shouting and like angry this and that like right. that doesn't I understand the anger because we should feel angry it right. angers there to say like an injustice has occurred you know you're being mistreated and, and like, you're not going to listen to the person the boundaries been crossed exactly yeah. so so I think like you know just thinking about this kind of stuff more feeling more grounded too and I think actually this is part of the reason I want to have this conversation is because as much as like I feel like I I don't know anything. It's like, I know some yeah. things, right? Yeah. And then there's still a lot that I need to learn. And the more that I learn, I mean, knowledge is power, right? right. And the more I feel grounded in having these conversations with people and people who might be, um, you know, have, have uh, differing perspectives. And I think like, unfortunately as women, and this may be being conspiracy theorists, like maybe yeah. it's part of the system or it's, it's not. Right. I don't think as many women are informed about like no. politics and how not the as system, many as you think. Yeah, right? how the system affects them, right? Right. I mean, it certainly is still a very male-dominated profession, right? I mean, right. you know, it, just any of this, these kinds of conversations. Right, that's um, true. A lot, it is a lot of white men, right. or men in general, talking about stuff exactly. on podcasts and, about Yeah, and I mean, we see that perpetuated in, in um, you know, the demographics of, of right. the policymakers and stuff like that. And, and the, right, I, mean, that's I don't know, like, I don't actually know the numbers again, like Canada, Justin Trudeau is like, we're right. going to have equal distribution yeah. between men and women. But like, but that, that's, what's it like here? It's nothing that, like that here, right? I mean, Chuck Grassley made a statement that, you know, cause he was criticized for how few women are on the Senate judiciary committee, mm-hmm. that that's the ones who vote first, um, to push the candidate forward. They're the ones who have the, 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 the hearing to, 
make sure you know the originally supreme court justices they're supposed to not be ideologues like they're supposed to be ruling according to the u.s constitution they're supposed to put their personal prejudices aside and that's what they're testing for in these hearings Mm -hmm. they haven't always been like up until i think up until anita hill and clarence thomas in 91 it it didn't turn into like a character i mean it is a character test i think that brett kavanaugh failed that and how he um, act, it's a job interview, right? So, yeah. like, these are not tri- these are not criminal trials. So, even that um, that when they brought in Doctor Ford and then had Kavanaugh respond, um, it was a it was still a job interview. Right. Like, it looks like it's a trial, but it's not. It's a yeah. job interview. Yeah. And I'm going on a tangent, but I think the point is is that um, it was a lot of white men asking these questions. So they had actually brought in a female prosecutor to ask Doctor Ford the questions because it would just the optics of that were were so bad with Anita right. Hill, yeah. they're just going to be even worse now. Yeah. So they brought in a woman to ask the questions, which is, it feels so gross, right? right? Totally. And then she was supposed to be asking the questions of Kavanaugh in the yeah. second part, and they just jumped. She was getting to some questions that were going to be incriminating for him, and they just took it over. Yeah. And so later on, you know, people were criticizing how, so many white men on, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Chuck Grassley was questioned about that this weekend, and his response which is so disgusting was essentially like listen like women don't want it's hard work being on the senate judiciary committee it's a lot of hours like a lot of women don't want to do it which Mm. is not true like you know and so a lot of female representatives and senators have responded to that but like you know one woman was talking today on um msnbc i forget who but she was talking about how she gets into work at 5 30 every morning and goes to maybe 20 events in a day and like what are you talking about like it's like yeah. They don't even see how yeah, how women are shut out. Right, exactly, exactly. So no, I mean I think that like I if I think if we felt more empowered and we felt more um, you know, grounded in some of these concepts, we yes. would be more likely to open our mouths in those places where That's a good you know point. the men are dominating the conversation or you know, I shouldn't say the men, but like the the more oppressive voices are dominating the conversation and right. you know and again like I mean I, I know this has become like a very partisan conversation but it doesn't even necessarily have to be it about that. Like, this politics is, no it doesn't have to be I mean this is just like ideology this is just like rights this is just equality this yeah. is like for women to be able to have a healthy you no know, and and it's not just women it's, it's people of any just dialogues yeah, grounded in and, information know, it's interesting because even like I, I mean I say any person with like a layer of oppression, but actually yeah. even men, white men, yeah. you know, when we talk about toxic masculinity, I mean, that is perpetuated they're, they're through these conversations by that too. too. They're totally oppressed by that, right? And so it's like, if we can just like have these kinds of conversations. I mean, maybe like, if we just start saying the men are also, because I think a big thread and theme this week too is like white male oppression. Like yeah. Trump spoke about like, you don't want your, like, I feel so right. worried for scary white men. Time it's scary to be a, a white man. man. Right but, world like, world maybe, world. let's bring him in. Like, maybe yeah. we can say it's a scary time to be a yeah. human being. It is. Like, whether you're a white man, although, you know, yeah. whatever. Sure, you can join us, too. Maybe yeah. it's just, a, maybe the solution yeah, yeah. is just, I mean, I, I started marketing. Maybe it's just, yeah. we're just marketing it wrong. And it totally. should literally be... Not, I hate saying literally, but actually it could just be like, you know what? Do you feel left out of this because right. you're being told that you're the one with all that and totally. with everything and we don't have... You can be a part of it yeah. too. And I think that that's maybe the case actually. Right, exactly. If and we just know, spin it that way. Well, that's sort of like I, I wrote an Instagram post about that this week and, and I started oh, I out know that. by being like, oh, well, no, yeah. no, no. I, yeah. I mean, I, you, you did. Sorry, I'm, I'm referring yeah. to one that only, the only post that I've written where oh. I basically just said oh, that like, one, yes. like I just said basically like thank you to the men who have stood behind yes. us. Right? Like thank, I want, I, I, I see you, I thank you because this is not about you're a man and therefore I hate you. Right. Right? It's like there are this is not we're trying not to paint with broad brush. And men can here. be feminist allies. Exactly. As well. I mean we are talking about the patriarchy at the end of the day, which affects men, which affects right. women, which affects all genders. But it also like, forces men to to a standard that's not maybe something that they align exactly. with. Right? Like totally. men are told that they have to be the breadwinners. Yeah. They have to be the strong ones. They're yeah. not allowed to cry. Totally. It's not masculine. You know, exactly. They, they don't have mental, mental health issues. Yeah. Don't, like it's, it, there's still a stigma, more stigma. Exactly. They have to be these like sexual gods. They have to be right. over six feet. You like, know? Right. They have to be charismatic and charming. Right. They have to like, be you know, funny. make X dollars a year. Right. Um, you know, have the impositions of power. Right. Um, you know, and if they don't, they don't count as much. And then there's a lot of anger right. around that. Exactly. Right? So, I mean, I think like, yeah, I think just understanding that like this affects every human and really what we're trying to do is just make our society a more like compassionate place where there's less suffering. And we just, yeah. Cause it does. I mean, yes, 
there is suffering, life is chaos, but yeah. just to minimize it a little more. Right. Like, it's yeah, I, I think if like I were trying to find a couple concrete asks out of this, it'd be like notice your internalized biases right. if you can, you know, um, try to jump in and have those conversations, like where it feels like there's a, a gateway and be yeah. an advocate, you know, do list like do the research. Like the, I know it's scary and overwhelming, but hopefully this gives you enough information to do a bit more research. So you feel grounded in your conversations. Right. And then also like, listen, like sit back and listen. Yeah. And sometimes we do have to just shut up, you know, like just mm-hmm. like you with your students when they're like, I hate white people. Just, I got to just Sometimes you just have to it. listen. And that's like a lot of people have trouble with that. And a lot of like a, the guy I went out with last night was like, well, some, I just feel like right now I, I can't say anything. Like I don't have a voice where I can say anything. And it's like, you know what? Like that's okay. maybe, maybe don't it's okay. you know maybe, maybe that's okay listen. maybe just listen for a little bit and be so, humbled by that yeah and exactly. embrace it it's kind of relaxing if you can just yeah, listen totally, totally like and just like yeah just like yeah. don't yeah and 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 you know and then and, you know like don't tune out like right like still relax and and, and pay relax attention and, and listen and you don't yeah. have to you don't have to necessarily have something yeah. to say and that can be like so healing for for people as well especially those who've been silenced and oppressed for so long so right yeah even cool. even white men just kidding. yeah yeah exactly. you can also be oppressed it's fine amazing well i mean um, ki- i'm kidding about that yeah I mean, yeah yeah people are like Bar- that's a podcast where she just decided that white men could also say they've been oppressed yeah. awesome no i i think that like, you get, I definitely you get what i'm that, saying that can happen right? yeah no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just when people. Oh yeah. And also like before I, we have to wrap up, but like, yeah. but right before that, like this idea that like you can have racism toward white people or reverse racism, like that's not a thing. That's not a thing. No, exactly. Like, that's race, actually something that. Yeah. Inherently in the word racism is like around oppression. And, right. Like, and white supremacy. Right? Yeah. And white so supremacy. yeah, I think we just said maybe if we stop using the word racist and use white supremacist to yeah. explain the way yeah. it is. But people think that that means you're like a Nazi. KKK. Yeah. Or remember. KKK. Exactly. I know. I know. So that's like, fuck, we got to find some new language. If we just use this. different words. If we just start using different words. Huh. I don't know. I mean, that's I know. maybe that's for next time. Okay, okay. come all up right. with the words. <laughs> okay. So, link, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all your wisdom, Sarah. You're thank just you for all your wisdom. Rock star. Thank you so, so much for listening. I really hope you got something out of that conversation and you're feeling a bit more empowered or able to join the conversation as a result. Um, And one thing that we didn't mention is in addition to the specific ask that we mentioned at the end, definitely make sure that you vote. Vote on my behalf. I can't. I'm Canadian. Um, So go to www.votesaveamerica.com. Again, votesaveamerica.com. And you can check and make sure that you're registered. And if you're not, you can register. And that's just one other way that you can have an impact on uh, continuing to move toward equality. Um, So thank you again for listening. I know this was a different episode. Um, We'll be back to uh, speaking with entrepreneurs next time. And, uh, you know, if you if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, please, please rate, review and subscribe, especially if you feel passionately about this conversation. The more that this gets shared and reviewed and rated and stuff, the more it becomes visible to other people who, again, might not otherwise listen to a conversation like this. So uh, you rock. Love you lots. And uh, we'll chat again soon.